Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Kubernetes Runtime Security with Falco and Sysdig. We'd like to welcome our presenter today, Jorge Salomero, Director of Product and Technical Marketing at Sysdig. Jorge, take it away. Thank you, Taylor. Um, so first of all, a little bit about uh, myself, so you know who is presenting today. As Tyler said, my name is Jorge Salomero. I run technical and product marketing here at Sysdig. Um, I used to speak at different DevOps and development conferences, and I was myself a Debian developer in the past. Now I work mostly on containers and Kubernetes. Um, I'm one of the persons behind some of the Falco integrations, which is what we are going to be talking today, a lot about Falco and runtime security. And you can follow more of my work on GitHub and Twitter as well. But before we get started, I want to give you a little bit of context about what Sysdig, what as a project or as an open source project as a company, and then what's exactly the relationship with Falco. So Sysdig started in 2013 as an open source project for Linux kernel uh, tracing uh, with container support, production ready. Uh, you can understand it as an evolution from TCP dump and Wireshark from the network into the entire operating system. All the system calls happening in that kernel. And we can use that to gain visibility into what's happening inside containers. And since they had Kubernetes support. Um, so that's how um, the project had started. A year later, um, a company was started from the people who created the product, the project. So Sysdic Monitor was a commercial product uh, to do um, Kubernetes monitoring, performance and availability monitoring. A few years later, um, Sysdic Secure was launched using the same technology, uh, helping um, implement security, looking at what's happening inside the containers. You can uh, find plenty of open source projects uh, that were born at Sysdig or Sysdig has contributed. Sysdig, Sysdig Inspect, Falco, and we have also contributed to eBPF and Prometheus uh, projects. Uh, but how Falco fits into uh, this picture? Well, Falco was originally started uh, by Sysdig, the company, but it's currently run independently by our community. And it's under the CNCF umbrella since uh, last year. Right now, it's a sandbox uh, project but hopefully um, it will be in the incubation phase and as there is an ongoing open proposal uh, to make the change. Falco leverages some of the uh, Sysdig open source libraries as we will see later as we explore a little bit deeper on the Falco architecture. Um, well, we need to answer why do we need a runtime security to understand uh, why we are talking today about, about this topic. Typically, when we are approaching uh, implementing security in cloud native stocks, the first thought we comes, we get to, uh, that it comes to our minds is like, all right, so let's do vulnerability scanning, typically either from our, our container registries or CICD pipeline. And then let's set up some kind of like um, user uh, identification and authentication system so I can set up the permissions on my Kubernetes cluster. But is that enough? Can we uh, make sure we implement security properly? When, um, even if we implement all these things, we need to make sure that um, these layers stop um, from happening all the bad things we don't want to happen, basically. And this is what runtime security is about. Actually, when I explain runtime security, I like to split it in four blocks or phases. Number, for, uh, number one uh, step, it's the prevention or the enforcement. This is basically when we set up all the permissions and Kubernetes on what you can do and what you cannot do. The next step is the detection or the audit. This basically tell us if those are barriers that were affected or something uh, went through. The third step is having the opportunity to block those attacks. Like basically if we were implementing a firewall, but again, against the entire system, not just the network. 
Step number four, sometimes uh, ignore or miss, but it's still very important, it's being able to audit and record everything so we can do effective incident response and forensics. So prevention, detection, blocking, and incident response and forensics. When we talk about prevention, as I was saying before, um, this is basically who can do what within Kubernetes. And the nice thing here is that Kubernetes provides a bunch of native controls to define that. Admission controllers, for example, allows us to hook into the deployment step into Kubernetes uh, when we schedule a pod and we can uh, define different policies to say this thing can be deployed in Kubernetes or not. We can write our own admission controllers, we can use the webhooks, or we can use some other more advanced frameworks like Open Policy Agent that help us to do that. The, uh, the other option uh, or another um, layer that we can do on prevention, it's Airbag. Airbag is basically Kubernetes permissions. How we define some users, the roles that they have, so we define what they can do, what they can access, what they can modify, which different resources they can change in our Kubernetes cluster. Another option is using network policies. Network policies is against another Kubernetes resource that allow us to define um, firewall or network access rules for our Kubernetes services. Another very interesting uh, resource it's based it's called pod security policies pod security policies allows us to define what's the security um context the security configuration of every pod it can be a, privi a privileged pod if it is if it's a read um read only root file system and also allows us to define and to enforce some runtime security uh profiles using the secom uh, or SLE Linux or a Parmer. Sycam allows to define uh, like a sandbox state where we can allow the system calls that a container is allowed to execute. Other uh, frameworks like SLE Linux or a Parmer are slightly more advanced and allow you to define what pods can do at the runtime with a more advanced uh, language. So we can say these process can access these files or can open these connections, just to give you a few examples. But our prevention is not enough. We need that second step or phase uh, within runtime security, which is detection. Detection helps to answer what happens with a control fails. It's basically our last line of defense. We need to have it for catastrophes. We need to have it to tell a story basically when the unexpected happens, when either we fail to configure properly uh, those enforcement mechanisms or the attacker could find gaps or holes to basically bypass those mechanisms. We will be applying these detections very few times, but it's very critical when we need it. Uh, also, this is very useful for auditing purposes. Uh, detection can be also be used to validate that the informants, enforcement mechanisms, they are actually working. And we can also use detection to validate, to make sure that those uh, policies, that those enforcement mechanisms, they doesn't break my applications. So it's not this exactly in a straight line. It's actually like a loop, allows us to uh, improve our enforcement. There are many use cases for detection. For example, even if we have uh, image scanning in our CICD pipeline and patch vulnerabilities or vulnerabilities that they don't have a public CVE won't be catched by those mechanisms. So detection is going to allow us to see, to monitor uh, your containers for anomalous behavior, which is going to be the way to catch anyone trying to exploit those third-day vulnerabilities. Can also use, be used to detect insecure configurations, leaked or insecure credentials, internal threats, like someone doing kubectl exec in the pod and starting making changes. And also it's going to be uh, very important for compliance and audit, and as I was mentioning before, I want to audit any changes at runtime across my infrastructure. There are a bunch of different approaches
uh, for doing runtime detection or visibility. One approach is using LD preload. LD preload allows us to hook into all the leaf sequels and see what each, uh, what is each of our processes is doing. Um, the consequences of using LD preload is that these mechanisms actually allows to change your application behavior. So from a security perspective, that's something that you might not be ready to trade off. Ptrace is another option. The limitation of Ptrace is that you can only uh, trace or monitor a single uh, uh, process ID and also will be capturing every system call. So it can have a significant performance impact. Again, also changes or can change in behavior. So that's something to consider from a security perspective. Sidecars uh, using uh, Kubernetes pods, it's another approach. You can have a pod that mounts um, the, the monitor pod uh, namespaces uh, are being shared between those two pods. I can access into the process, network storage. So from one pod, I can get visibility into the other. There's, this is a, uh, in principle a good approach, similar to what it could be Prometheus exporters, for example. Um, the limitations are here uh, are basically the instrumentation overhead, the complexity, and that the visibility that you get is basically limited to the scope of that pod that you're monitoring. A fourth approach is using a kernel-based approach. And leveraging uh, either a kernel module or the eBPF approach to get uh, visibility, it's a, a better approach to get uh, very close to total system visibility, as we will be capturing all the system calls that, and we can use that to get visibility into all containers or every single process running on your hosts. One of the benefits of these is that we can uh, capture this activity asynchronously, so it has a very low performance impact. Both kernel and EBPF proof require your kernel headers to be built uh, the difference between the kernel and the eBPF proof is that the eBPF proof runs in a safe mode inside the eBPF machine, so it can be considered more safe. Um, we wrote a blog post where we discuss both options and the benefits of eBPF, so you can check that out if you want to know more information. Now, let's talk, let, let's talk more about how Falco leverages uh, these. Falco is uh, uh, considered the Kubernetes, and it's basically a detection engine for any kind of anomalous activity that might be happening in your host on your containers. Falco leverages a set of rules that follow a syntax very similar to TCP dump to define what it's considered anomalous and what it's considered safe. Leverages some open source libraries, leaves a scap and leaves a snip. Uh, coming from the Cisic open source project to get its visibility. And it has uh, Kubernetes native support. This means that every system call, it's tagged by the Kubernetes context, namespace, deployment, uh, team on set, pod, et cetera. So we know from which uh, application or microservices each is each, each activity coming. And Falco can also hook into the Cube API server audit. So we, we can get information about what's happening at the orchestration layer. Well, we'll see some examples in a second. The problems that Falco solve are things like, are my hosts and containers doing something that they shouldn't? So for example, there is any unexpected spawn process, like a Postgres SQL container spawning something different or a process um, doing something like installing a new package or changing a uh, configuration at running, at runtime inside the container, or looking at network activity. For example, like an Nginx container starting a new listening port or doing an unexpected uh, network connection. We can also look at the orchestration uh, activity. For example, we can answer if a Kubernetes user did a kubectl exec or kubectl attach into a shell uh, into a privileged container and it started doing some changes there. So these are the kind of uh, 
questions that you are going to be able to answer with Falco. Falco architecture, um, it can be uh, understood following this diagram. Uh, we have like a, the kernel module or EVPF proof from where we get every system call so we can see what's happening in the system. We'll be uh, leveraging LibSCAP and LibSNEEP uh, libraries to, to organize, to reconstruct that activity and send it to the uh, filtering engine. All that information, it's combined with the Kubernetes um, metadata and labels and also with all the events coming from the Kube API server. We match all that activity against the Falco rules. And if anything um, matches, we can define that, yes, there was some unexpected uh, behavior. And we can trigger a number of notifications across different mechanisms. Syslog, a file output, a standard output, we can execute commands, we can trigger webhooks. Or if we want to extend things a little bit further, we have a gRPC um, output that uses TLS, so it's fully secure. Then, and then we have a bunch of uh, different projects or side projects to Falco that you can use to um, either send notification, uh, notifications to other places like PagerDuty, Opsgeny, um, Datadog, Elasticsearch, uh, um, AWS SNS or Google PubSub using Falco Sidekick. You can also control um, Falco using the client Go, and you can write your own. And we also have a Prometheus exporter that allows to, to allows to monitor and get metrics of all the events being triggered. If we look a little bit at how Falco is being deployed, Falco is typically packaged into a container, and you will be deploying your cluster using a daemon set. From that container and hooking into the host kernel using eVPF will uh, gain visibility into any process, either running on the host or inside any container mechanisms or, or technology, Docker, Container D, Cryo, you name it. If we look uh, deeper in, in how Falk works, basically uh, we are going to the, the magic and um, we have uh, their, um, the kernel or the VPF proof because copies all the system calls into a ring share buffer with user space. This is basically like a clock uh, and we are filling um, new system calls and we uh, do basically drop everything at the end. With all this um, state of information, we have these libraries that basically control uh, the reads and writes on this buffer and we reconstruct all the activity and we have this kind of like a state engine that we can use to match against our filtering rules. At the end, Falco is just a common line uh, to handle these libraries and allow to, to handle all that. And if you let me go uh, even a little bit deeper and show you some of the peculiarities of Falco VPF implementation, um, there is something that makes um, Falco and also the Cystic library is different. Typically, eVPF programs, they use these map uh, data structures to control all the communication between the eVPF uh, program running in the kernel and the user space. Uh, on Cystic and Falco, there is an additional ring buffer that we showed before that provides a high throughput channel between the kernel and the user space. So the eVPF map structures, they are just used for signaling and control. And the ring buffer is used to move all this data into user space where we can mix it with um, a container and Kubernetes context uh, so we can give it a little bit more of sense. You might be wondering how these rules uh, actually work. Uh, I mentioned before that this is something very similar to TCP dump filters where you have a name uh, for the rule, description, and then the condition. This is basically the filter. So here we are looking, uh, or we want to detect if uh, any of my node uh, GS uh, containers run any process which is not the 
the node key as binary. So we are going to write a rule like this. We are looking for event type exactly, so this is a system call we are looking. We want to look for someone or some container executing the process. We want to look at all these system calls within this scope, my Kubernetes deployment called my node app. And we want to detect if any process it's not called node. If anything uh, happens that it's different to this, we will trigger um, the rule uh, sending this output. And here we can add some placeholders so we can get additional information like the username, that is found on processes, that process, the process name and common line args, and from which container this is coming. You can use many uh, filters to create these roles. Uh, filter for processes, for users, for file system activity, network, for also to define from which Kubernetes scope is coming, including pods, replication controllers, services, naming spaces, replica sets, deployments, etc. You can find all these documented on Falco documentation. But Falco can also hook into the Cube API events. So, for example, I am able to detect if someone is creating or modifying a config map that has some private credentials inside rather than using a secret. So the way I, I would be doing that is uh, writing a rule like this. And here, this rule is a slightly more advanced because we are using macros to simplify the condition of this rule. This rule, it's going to look for config maps and then in, in our Kubernetes um, event audit, any modification on those config maps and to see if those uh, modifications contain any private credentials. So config map, we define it as a Kubernetes uh, resource, which is a config map. A modify macro is defined as any create, update, or patch verb of actions. And then the contains private credentials. It's a macro that basically uh, looks at the payload of the config map object and contains, for example, these different strings. This is basically how you would be writing these roles. But you, were, you might be wondering, all right, so these are just two examples, but tell me what are the like, typical scenarios. And this is something that we cover on the Sysday Continuum Usage Report, where we looked at real production data uh, of, of Falco and Sysday Secure, and which were the alerts uh, more typically triggered. And examples like containers writing below ATC, or writing below a slash root, uh, or launching privileged container, or containers that they launch uh, sensitive nouns, or they rewrite uh, files under a binary directory, or just running a shell directly on the container. These are examples of top uh, runtime policy violations. And we are going to find Falco rules created uh, out of the box, available as part of the default configuration to detect all these things. But um, when people are deploying Falco, these are the typical examples, the typical use cases they, they use it for. And actually we have detection rules created out of the box for this. So uh, people check for best practices when running containers. So we detect uh, that someone is not updating packages, not modifying binary directories or modifying the configuration, reading sensitive files, or containers spawning unexpected processes, or changing the executing namespace, running privileged containers, sensitive mounts, or running shells. This is also useful for compliance. We can do file integrity monitoring, we can monitor the launch of privileged containers, or making um, changes on Kubernetes configuration, like config maps, uh, role changes, and rules that they match basically PCI or needs uh, regulatory frameworks. Falco can also be used to detect specific CVEs, some of them uh, seen in Kubernetes environments like the QFCTL copy or the RunC breakout. And also the Falco community provides default rule sets to uh, monitor unexpected behavior 
on very uh, typical cloud native stacks like uh, Rook, MongoDB, Postgres, the Kubernetes control plane itself, Nginx, Elasticsearch, etc. You can find many of these rules on the security hub. This aggregates uh, detection rules for Falco and soon other projects. Uh, so we help you to implement Kubernetes security best practices. All these um, alerts that you get from Falco, uh, the way that you usually consume them are basically forwarding them into a CM system. You can uh, connect Falco to different CM systems. And if you didn't have anything, you can use, for example, uh, Kibana. You can forward your Falco event to Elasticsearch and then use Kibana to create dashboards about uh, what's happening in your computers. Um, as I was explaining runtime security before, and they mentioned that a third step was actually blocking. We prevent uh, users from doing things or services from doing things that they shouldn't. Then we detect activity. And if we uh, detect any unexpected activity, we can respond to that blocking that unexpected behavior. And this is what it's a response engine about. We can trigger automatically reactions to 13 events to block uh, these attacks or unexpected behavior. This is basically executing playbooks and we, use, uh, we do that using functions as a service. We have implemented response engine for different technologies using open source uh, framework, uh, functions as a service, frameworks or using Google Cloud or AWS and examples of different actions that you can execute. It's for example, tinting a node with no schedule. So no other parts are scheduled on that uh, node in case there was a container breakout. Isolate the pod using the network policy, delete the offending pod, the scaling down the deployment to zero, trigger assisted capture for forensics or send a notification to different channels like a Slack. Different organizations that you're already using uh, Falcon production from Bus Allen to Frame.io, for example, uh, Shopify, Sumo Logic, or Cisic itself. So um, you can read a more comprehensive list into the adopters uh, file in the Falcon security uh, repository. And I encourage you, uh, if you're using Falcon yourself, to do a PR and tell us your story about how you're using Falcon production there. If you want to uh, get more uh, involved into the Falco community, of course, the first place to start is the Falco.org website. You can find interest in blog posts and more content on Falco on the Falco.org blog, but also on the Cystic blog, where we used to uh, write a lot about Falco. Uh, of course, on the GitHub organization, and we also have in the Slack community, docs, and then the security have I mentioned before, where you'll be, where you'll be able to discover uh, Falco rules, but also contribute uh, rules that you might be writing yourself. Now, I would like to talk a little bit more about how Sysic extends the Falco functionality in some of the products. We saw how it's a runtime detection, but this is just in a small part of your entire security approach. Uh, when uh, we are talking about uh, implementing security in your containers or your cloud native stack, I like to split this in again in three phases, the build, the run and respond phases. As you build and deploy your containers, you might be doing image scanning and configuration validation. As the containers that you start running in production, you do detection of uh, unexpected behavior but also you need to create that policy, maintain it, uh, maybe uh, find mechanisms to build those uh, policies or roles automatically or to respond to block those threats. And then in case something uh, unexpected happens, you need to be prepared to respond using incident response mechanisms, forensics analysis, and now with all the activity. Of course, compliance is not one step process in this uh, life cycle, but needs to be implemented across um, the entire life cycle. And then Cisic Secure can help you with 
something to highlight about uh, the Cystic platform is that leverages uh, open source components to build all this functionality. So you'll be uh, finding the Anchor engine for image scanning, Prometheus for monitoring, Falco for runtime detection, and Cystic for the visibility for forensics and troubleshooting. And we use these data sources to build a platform that adds a scale some workflow and Kubernetes and cloud context around all these data. Um, when we are talking about um, these um, uh, um, troubleshooting, all these different use cases, uh, we see that it's actually the DevOps teams, the ones that they uh, take care of uh, security now in Kubernetes and containers. We see that security is now part of the DevOps process. We call this DevSecOps or Secure DevOps. And this is where Cystic Platform uh, helps you. And now let me show you just three or four examples on how you can extend Falco to make it easier to use and to use it in production environments um, and more easily. One of the functionality that we have here is the Falco editor that you will find in Cystic Secure. The Falco editor allows you to edit Falco rules directly from this UI and to build your policies directly uh, from this UI or from APIs, where you can define the name, the description of the role, but also you, you can define the scope directly here, and you can have multiple roles. Also from here, you can also uh, configure the different blocking or response actions, like stopping the container, pausing the container, or taking a capture file. You can also find in secure the Falco library that allows to uh, pull in different rules or um, policies to, to create uh, your runtime policy based, built on uh, best practices and different um, framework, uh, compliance frameworks or attack frameworks like the Mitra attack framework. So you can build your runtime policy from a number of examples and default out of the box rules that you find here. Another good example on extending Falco, it's the tuning functionality. We have seen that if you misconfigure your runtime policy, um, it might be triggering a lot of false positives. Or if you deploy a new application, a new version of your applications, things might have changed. So you need to fine tune your rules. Falco tuning functionality looks at all the events being fired in your system and looks at what needs to be uh, changed or uh, fine tuned so you reduce the number of uh, rules that they are being uh, triggered all the time. Another example is profiling. We see that some users, they don't want to spend time creating manually uh, their runtime rules and policies. So profiling basically use detections, use that visibility to learn um, how containers they behave, looking at the network, uh, connections, processes, file system activity or system calls, and then generating those runtime rules, that the runtime policy automatically for you. Another example is um, uh, the policy advisor. Policy advisor uh, looks at the running containers and allows to generate the most restrictive pod security policy for that running container and then validate it against uh, the running behavior. So we make sure that your pod security policy doesn't break your running applications. Pod security policies, can, as we mentioned before, can be used as an enforcement mechanisms in your Kubernetes cluster. So we define what the pods can and cannot do, and we block um, anomalous behavior before actually it happens. Last but not least, we mentioned how this detection, this runtime data, it's very important to tell a story of what happened. This is audit and incident response and forensics. Being able to correlate orchestration layer activity, like for example, a user or a service account doing a kubectl execute to a pod 
and running a number of commands. It's something that you can um, do with system. If you like all this, you can find um, Sysdig and some members of the Falco community in some upcoming events. So we are running a number of Star Wars premieres. If you want to come with us to the cinema and enjoy Star Wars, uh, you can do that and you get your invite to that link. Next year, uh, you'll find us in uh, RSA, KubeCon, and Red Hat uh, Summit, just to mention a few events. And well, if you want to learn more about this, don't forget to check out the falco.org website. I also wanted to include here a link to the container uses report and a webinar I quote before. Don't forget to subscribe to the sysdate.com blog. And if, well, last week, uh, Kubernetes 1.17 was released, and we always like to write a blog post on what's new. That one uh, became very popular, so again, I would like to use this opportunity to share that link again with you. Thanks very much for listening today, and I hope you enjoy. Thanks, Jorge, for a great presentation. We look forward to seeing you again at another CNCF webinar.